already. <laughs> the battle trucks. Hey, you're on. <laughs> oh no! I no, think they can actually hear us now. We're so just... excited to have another. Oh, session. hold on! We're not on yet. I mean, we are. There we are. We're on. We're so excited to have another session. We are. Uh, as usual, stressful. everyone, if you could let us know that you can hear us and see us, we had kind of a sprint this evening getting ready. Um, you know, and we realized we have not been introducing ourselves to any, for any. Somebody <laughs> called the shop the other day. They're, they're like, like, hey, is this the dude with the white beard? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I got some just for men. And I've evened it out, so I'm gonna try that. I trimmed it so it's not quite so white. Being called the dude <laughs> is not a bad thing. All right, Chris, thanks a lot. Well, Sounds like we can. Uh, all right, good. And- Chris can hear us and yeah, see us, which perfect. is, I mean, two for two is pretty good. Uh, by the way, uh, so uh, you want to introduce yourself? Or? Well, I mean, we we built up to it, and then we, we did. didn't. Do it. Well, I'm Brian Pitzer of the Northern Angler in Traverse City, Michigan, and. This is Matt Hartman. I'm Matt Hartman here, he uh, president, the president of Northern Angler AV Club. Uh, yep. Uh, so this has been, <laughs> there's so many chords. We should do a behind the scenes we sometime. I think it would scenes because, uh, make yeah, people's I, brains explode. We should just keep so. this Steve, welcome. Like you Perfly, Mark, everyone. Man, we got all sorts of oh, people is, chiming so. in. Thank you Thanks for tuning so in. much for tuning in tonight. Um, few bits of announcements uh if you if you haven't seen it already uh we posted this on instagram actually what's this yesterday. stuff i'm not allowed to post anything well i, 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 I don't have the keys anymore <laughs> it's <laughs> not that brian loses me? the passwords all the time <laughs> you don't trust me to post things properly anyways we'll get into that on the on maybe we'll get into that on the thing we're going to announce actually the podcast we just started we're doing a podcast? Yeah. Spooled, the Northern Angler podcast. So we talk about everything fishing in Michigan, the Midwest, and beyond. Uh, and then we call a bunch of Brian's uh, notable friends and give you tips, tricks, all the fun stuff. So um, give it a listen. Just so you know, short season. I mean, six to eight episodes, and then things get crazy for us. So we'll try and fill them in as we go. I but. think we can do them during the spring, too. We'll see. We'll see how committed we get, so it'll be fun. Or uh, you will be committed let's see. at the end. So, who's our guest tonight, Matt? Oh, <laughs> uh, we got our friend Andy here tonight. Andy Gerard is here, so he is. You're officially on camera yeah, now, which is exciting. Camera. Fantastic. Hopefully, they can hear you as well. So they've, they've trapped me in Pitzer's basement. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And they won't let me leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> yeah, there, there is that. You're, you can't get out of there. It's no. No, I'm literally trapped. <laughs> we gave him a bathroom at least. So <laughs> it's not there, a big a deal. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, Andy's uh, been around for quite a while. Uh, he's done. 45 years old. <laughs> <laughs> How Proud long of you. have you been tying flies, Andy? <laughs> I started tying flies when I was 10. Wow. About two years before I started fly fishing. So um, who taught you how to tie flies? Uh, Fred Schnook. Over, he owned the uh, Alporn shop over in Gaylord. That's right. Yep. Yep. He used to have a small fly fishing section and he did a fly tying class there. And uh, I took it when I was 10. And I was in there with a bunch of people that were in their 40s and 50s. And I think I've got a picture somewhere of a uh, baseball hat on sideways, typical 10 year old. <laughs> um, I was just telling these guys I haven't touched my vice in six months. That's the longest I've ever gone since I took that you, fly tying class. You know, wow. you don't have to admit that. I'm here. totally um. going to admit that because when I'm breaking thread, <laughs> I want some contact. <laughs> so was that Vaughn Snook's dad? Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I wish Vaughn were still in the state, like one of our biologists here. Oh, yeah. I think he's over in Minnesota as a fisheries biologist or yep. wildlife biologist. Great guy. Shameless plug, why you were talking about taking a fly tying class, we have just a few spots left for our February intro class. I nice segue. Uh, I know. Yeah. I just we're getting better at this. So. Wow, Matt, <laughs> you are on your A game tonight. It's not just fancy because cameras. I just because oh. everyone saw me open my first beer. That's why. Right, <laughs> and it is your first beer, which is odd for. Well, oh, it's not a that Wednesday odd. night. I mean, for a Wednesday night, I do okay. <laughs> it's trying to get better. You know. So how so. many? Like you, I know you tie commercially, Andy. How many? How many? Or you used to or used to used to. How many, Good for you. When you yeah. were doing it, 
How is that a five dozen? step program? Yeah. <laughs> how many how many dozen a year were you tied I, at one point? I think I was on the lower end for a lot of the tires for the place I tied for. Um, I was probably doing somewhere between 100 and 150 dozen a year. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yep. So well, Gates is known for that. I mean, Gates has they have the best fly selection around. Like they truly do on all their drives. Or we so love good. to go in and we, nerd out on some of that stuff. I do. I, mean. I, I respect the heck out of those guys, and, and uh, you know, I try and spend a few nights over there and go. Go see Josh and everyone eat yep. at the restaurant. So yeah, that's your opening day program. Usually, opening day yeah. program. We were just over there in November to do a red survey and stuff. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I tied for them. Uh, I started tying for Rusty. Uh, I don't even remember how years, how many years ago. And then uh, was tying for Josh up until about two years ago. And then the uh, the current job was was killing the uh, ability to tie. Sure. So. Well, you know, and and. We'll, having a family and all that other stuff. Right. I yes. mean, it, it takes time. <laughs> yep. And, it's uh, time. Right. So, so it's kind of nice. The first time in my life or first time in probably 20 some years that if I sit down to tie, I'm just tying for myself. So it's, it's a weird thing to get used to. Sure. But think, of you know, how many thousands of dozens that you've tied over the years and, you know, um, you know, especially like the dry flies and the proportions and everything that just come automatically to you yep. that maybe other people struggle with. Yep. And that's, Tonight I'm going to go through one specific technique with a couple different applications and I'll try and go through my thought process when I'm tying. A lot of it's on autopilot, but uh, yeah, we'll do our best. Sure. I'm excited to have someone tie in dry flies. You know, we're Andy and I were talking about how many people tie streamers now. I mean, mm-hmm. and it, streamers are a lot of fun to tie, but I think there's some perception that you know, dries do not produce the same fish. And I think that is just about as far away from the truth. Absolutely. I think streamers are flashy and there's no rules with them whatsoever. You can do crazy stuff. It's with fun. Them it's and just, dries. it's creative, you know, blank yeah. canvas. Right. And then dries, it's, you're kind of limited by the amount of materials you can use and the, the craziness you can do. So I think dries are more challenging. I mean, you need to be precise Mm -hmm. you need to be delicate and then it's tougher to stay within proportions in a small hook than you know last week we did what a four out and a five out for a musky (laughs) fly pretty large margin of air yeah exactly i just found my uh i've got an old uh wheat leaf fly box one of the little tiny ones with a swing leaf in it and i had that thing filled up when i lived in colorado with my midges and i completely forgotten about that you know Almost, I think the biggest in there was an 18, but most of it was 22 to 26. Just oh the whole freaking thing. Just thousands of flies in that little <laughs> little tiny tin. That's a, that's crazy when you think about that. Yeah. You know, and then we went through that thing where you couldn't get hackle. We're still struggling yeah. with getting enough hackle. My daughter's got one in her hair right now. You know, my five-year-old. It's coming it's crazy, back. Right? It is start, coming back. <laughs> Lily asked don't me start to do hoarding. that this year. This Buy it summer. now. Gosh, I was like, don't bring it back. Don't do it. Don't do it. We're just recovering. So what are we going to tie tonight? I'm going to tie, I'm going to attempt to tie two different things. Um, I'm going to focus on stack tackles. Um, I started tying this fly that's in the vise right now um, for gates, I don't know, seven, eight years ago as a stack tackle spinner. It's you know, with the, the varying size of hackles, you can adjust this from a size 20 all the way up to a hex. So the only difference is, like, up to about a brown drake, you can, I'm use, utilizing the stack tackle to make oh, this silhouette, silhouette of um, the wings. So when you get into the bigger bugs, like a hex, you can still use the stack tackle, but instead of imitating the wings, you're imitating the legs. Just you're kind of limited by the length of the hackle. By the hackle, sure. And it's hard to find <laughs> hackle to make it bigger for the hex. So if you got some of those old dry fly capes from the 80s and 90s, like hold on to those things because some of those feathers are perfect for this kind of stuff. It really is difficult to find something that big. We've been using some of the new whiting, almost like they're, what is that, bugger pack or... I like, I've been, for a few years, I was using bugger packs for hex, yeah. actually. I mean, you they're know, really not that bad. You're, they're not quite as stiff as some of your regular necks, but I'm, I mean, I'm putting yeah. a ton of it on it. Yep. They work. 
Yep. You just yeah. gotta you gotta look through it because a lot of those bigger hackles get really webby, and you yep. want to mm-hmm. stay yep. away from that. Yeah. So. Yep. The other one I found, you know, bugger packs have been tough to get lately. Um, we get some Ewing deceiver capes or uh, patches as well. Nice, you know, all deceive, but it's a, instead of loose, strong feathers, it's nice to have, you know, great for buggers, great for your big dry fly. So, yep. Sure. Uh, Mark Lord is curious if you remember him from back in the day. I do remember him. He says Actually, hello. My, uh, shoot, I worked for one summer at Orvis when they were in the, uh, at the resort. At the resort? Yep. Sure. So I do remember working with him. Yep. He's going to be doing um, an upcoming. Wrangly style streamers yeah. is what I remember him tying. Yeah. He's doing some more dries and, and emergers and spinners, I think, for yep. us this He's time around He's doing some tying too, so. for us, yeah. too, for the winter. Cool. Yeah. yeah. It's a, I mean, it's a small community, you know, really in the tying world, I think. so. Absolutely. And just so you know, I'm, I'm waiting for those of you out there uh, to get a call from my son. He's flying in from Montana tonight. So when I get to go ahead, I may just have to bail. So Storm is going to sit in storm, for him. We, storm, already storm, tried we, got, we got dog headphones, headphones for Storm tonight. So. Yeah. So. All right. Let's get started. <laughs> okay. So here's the guy that we're going to tie first. This is... Um, this is what I use for uh, Hendrickson's, so that we're going to tie it on a size 12. Again, you can tie it on any size hook you want. You can scale this thing up or down. Um, we're pretty much going to focus on the technique for the stack tackle. You can use whatever body material you want, whatever kind of dubbing you want, whatever suits your fancy. Um, the main reason that this thing is so nice to fish, especially when we're talking in the spring with spinner falls, is a lot of times you're doing this right at dusk. And a lot of the, when I started tying this um, back in the late 90s, um, a lot of the spinner patterns were flat, you know. Sure, the flat wing spinners. And so they're a pain in the ass to see on the water. Um, This one, if you look at it from the bottom, it's got the silhouette of the wings, which is all you need. But when you're looking at it from the water surface, looking at it, you get this nice poof of hackle on the top. And it's super, super easy to see. And the fish don't care. I started fishing these, um, you know, type hackle stackers for the trichos. Yep. And, I mean, the beauty of these patterns, you know, it's that's a really good point. You can really see them. It makes a huge, it makes a world of difference. The fish don't care. It's easier to see. Like, the older I get, the more I get into. It has nothing with eyesight or anything like that. Eyesight's perfect, people. Um, it's simplicity like i like simple patterns um i don't want to overly complicate things and it just it works so get started on her let's see a lot of good comments tonight i think some more entertaining ones than i've seen in a while so bring them on i'm thick skinned people so if i make some errors or see something you don't like please call me out on it Absolutely. Did you talk about what thread you're using there yet? I did not. I am not picky with stuff like that. If I'm okay. going to tie on anything from a 14 down to, a, you know, a brown drake or something, I just throw on 6 hot. I don't mess around with 8 dot until I get into 16s and 18s. Um, the one thing I do with this is right after I cut off the thread, I just put it in my mouth and hang on to it. I'm going to use that to split the, um, the tails. So... This one we're going to um, use a bite for the body, so we don't have to worry too much about uh, putting a taper on the body at all. On the back half of the fly, um, the the bite's going to do it on its own. So you can use anything for the tail, anything you want. Um, I've got fibbits here. I usually just grab two. If you want to use two on each side, four total, that's fine. Um, I just like the the simple profile of two. And if one gets torn off, I just throw the fly away and I tie more because I tie a ton of flies. Basically, um, I don't get too overly complicated about the proportions. Um, with the tail, the spinner tail is obviously a lot longer than a, than a done tail. So I usually take um, about the same length as the hook and then another half. So one and a half lengths the hook and I usually just kind of eyeball it. And I tie it right on top of the hook. 
Just nice even wraps all the way up and then all the way back. Do you use any other type of tailing materials or yeah, fibers? Yeah, I'll use hackle. Um, on some of the bigger bugs, I'll use. I still like moose moose mane um, for hacks and stuff like that. It's just it's, it looks awesome. It's pretty durable. Um, I tend to use fibbits for anything in that, from like sulfurs down to um, Hendrickson's. Um, when I get into like anybody else, when you get into the bigger bugs, moose mane, yep. I prefer. Or just straight up hackle. But if you can see that, um, as long as they're laying flat on top of the hook, we'll just go through and we'll take that piece of thread that we cut off at the beginning and we'll just kind of try and spread out the two. Just manually spread them out. And the thread is going to keep them permanently spread out. This so is like, a this is a great technique. I learned this tie in the RS too. I remember that yeah. very clearly. I it's do it a, on every single spinner fly I do. Yeah. I like... I don't like just having random feathers sure. in there for the tail. I like to have that defined split, I think. Especially with spinners, you're just going to focus in on the main attributes of a spinner. You want really light, translucent wings. You don't want to overdo it with the wings. And you want very defined tails. That's it's, it. it's the most delicate, you know, phase of yeah. the That's of the more fly. important so, than yeah. even size in some points. I get away with different size flies even... You know, when you've got mixed hatches going on, as long as the silhouette's right. So basically, I don't know if you can see that. I just kind of manually split them, and then I put the thread, um, kind of feed it back to the bend of the hook, and pull it straight back, and grab it. So it's kind of looped around the hook. Wow. And then I just feed it up in between the two fibbits or whatever tail material you have and just kind of gently lay it over the back of the fly and I'll let the thread kind of trap it down. Now the tighter you tie the thread, the more you're going to push those, those tails out. So I just kind of loosely wrap it back and then lock it into place because the pressure is going to spread it out. But I kind of want it roughly like that. So it's a little trickier if you really want to get super anal about this. And if you've got a mayfly that has three tails versus two, um, oh, no. you can still do it, but it's it's a little trickier. So there we go, the tail portion. Um, for the body, you can use dubbing. You can use whatever whatever works for you. I've On this particular pattern, I really like the segmentation that Biots give you. Um, the only reason I'm using turkey biots is they're a little narrower, a little longer, and it's easier to wrap with. Um, you can use goose biots if you want. I always thought biot. I remember when I first started tying, I thought biots were, you know, this super tough thing. You know, I had always read about strip quills and yeah. soaking them, and I assumed biots were along the same line. They're not. They're yeah. so easy they're to just use. And they're stupid turkeys. Yeah. <laughs> and they're cheap. They're not a fancy bird. They're, they're not easy. a fancy time. Material. I mean, it's they it's, look great though. I they mean, do they work are. well. They give it that yeah. segmentation. I mean, the only limitation is, is size of your fly, really. Yep. And you, I don't see many people tie them. I mean, twelve is probably max in my experience. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, maybe some tens. I'll if tie you them find on some brown drakes, ones. but you have to be picky about. I buy them in bulk, and you have to go through and actually feather them out and see kind of pick the longer ones like these these are plenty long enough for tying on brown drakes or bigger flies down in the 10 maybe even a size 8 hook yeah um but when you get down towards the lower end so a lot of times when i go production tie on smaller bugs i'd use some of the ones down here first and i throw them away and save them for you know the bigger bugs so you can put it in multiple ways i like to put it in the concave out um i just like the look of that you can do concave in if you want and i just kind of lay it against the hook shank and just do a very soft wrap so that i get the orientation i want the biggest thing with me i sometimes i'd start an order and i'd mix it up and and have it concave in and i just make sure i did the whole order that way <laughs> so whatever works for you um this is one of the few times that I use hackle pliers. It's just easier to gently kind of wrap this guy around without kind of have to 
I think the hardest part about fly tying is material handling. And you just kind of had to learn which materials you had to be gentle with and which ones you can crank on. I 100% agree with that. It's it's learning to manipulate materials. Yep. And if you can manipulate all the material, you know, the majority out there, you can tie pretty much any fly. Yep. So Absolutely. So I just do, you can, if you want to, if you want to make these more durable, um, I kind of look at spinner flies as kind of, trash flies in my mind they're you know i don't put a lot of effort into them because you're going to lose a lot of them it's a Um, single use i I tie a lot of them so i don't care if i lose them i don't care if they fall apart if you want them to you can put a little dab of glue on the thread wraps and then wrap the bite over it and that'll really lock it in but i don't have these things fall apart very often um so I overlap, I don't know if you can see that or not, but I tend to overlap the... We can see it. Okay, the wraps of the bayet just a little bit, and then I kind of loosen it up as I go further. Um, about two-thirds of the way up the hook. If you go too far back, if you do it halfway up the hook, um, the wings are going to be way too wide, and it's going to look a little wonky donkey. So we had a question here. What yeah. color do you... Uh... Like for the Hendrickson's, this. That what <laughs> what color is that biot? This is uh, mahogany. Mahogany. Yep. Mahogany yeah, brown yeah. turkey biot. Yep. So, here is the point where you can do a lot of different things. Um, you can finish this off in any which way you would like for a, a spinner. If you're going to do a stack tackle, the next step is getting some kind of post. Um, I use. This crinkles Elon. Um, you don't want it to use too much. If this is your first time doing it, you don't want it to be too thin because you're going to wrap hackle around it. So you need something a little bit to hold on to, but you don't want too much because then when you fold it over, it's going to ball up too big. So I got about this much Zelon. I'll lay it right on top of the hook, kind of pinch it with my fingers to keep it in place, do a soft wrap, pull it down, another soft wrap, pull it down, and then back it up right where I want the wing to start, which is right where the bayet ended. So right about there. Fluff everywhere. Clip off the front part. So picking out the hackle. I did not, I just kind of ran, last night just went through and was going through my hackle bin and grabbed a couple hackle that I thought would be close. Um, so the wings on these things, you want it a little bit bigger or the hackle for this with a stack tackle wing, you want it a little bit bigger than what you would use if you were using tying a standard dry fly with hackle. The reason being is there's usually a wing portion on a standard fly that sticks up and then you're using hackle to imitate the legs. So the legs don't stick out as far as the wings for this fly. We're using this to imitate the wings and not the legs, so you want it a little bit bigger. So if you've got like a a hackle gauge on your vise and you're tying on a size 12 hook, you don't want to, your first instinct is to wrap it around that post and go, all right, here's the size 12, that's the one. You actually want it a little bit bigger, so get like a size 10 hackle. Uh, This looks kind of right. I'm just going to eyeball it. So, once you get your hackle, go in and tie that right next to the post. Wrap it down good and snug. And then we're going to put a little bit of dubbing on the thorax. Thorax, right? The thorax. This is how long it's Are you saying I'm not the only one that mixes those up still, like... (laughs) I, I do mix them up. I don't think I use them. Just to. say it with confidence and then you'll somebody be fine. on the internet will correct me. <laughs> Guaranteed. So <laughs> I'll use the bleep button. I can use the bleep button when you say it. So. No bleep. So w- which part of it is it? That's the <laughs> perfect. <laughs> I said the correct We goof term. off a little bit. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> so you don't want to, like, it, I tend to, when I've done classes before with beginners and stuff everybody overdoes everything so you want to do as little as possible i got some super fine dubbing here in like a mahogany brown color Um, i'm just putting a tiny little bit on here i just want to cover up the thread wraps 
Just work my way forward. Get the thread right at the end. So the tricky bit with this, I got the post. If you've got a post holder, that's great. I tend to not keep all the extra stuff on my vise. I just do it by hand. It just ends up getting in my way. Um, but basically we want to hold this post up and then we're going to slowly wrap the hackle around it. Really tight wraps next to each other. You don't want a bunch of gaps. And we're only going to go up as far as when you fold this post over, we want to be able to tie it down flat. So we don't want to go, you know, quarter inch, half inch up. We're going to do like an eighth of an inch up. And then I'm going to wrap all the way back down to the base. And I'm going to pull it in tight on this side. And I'm going to fold it over. I'm not even going to wrap it off. So on a standard parachute, <clears throat> if we were doing a standard parachute, we wrap the hackle around, wrap it back down, and then you do a, a wrap around the base with a thread to tie it in. This one is actually, we're just going to cinch it right in when we pull this thing over. I've never had one pull out. Um, they're disposable, right? I mean, remember. Disposable. Yeah. So yeah. don't get too overly into these things. So I like is, doing it with that, with a thread loop. I mean, it's almost, I can just hook it on one finger and then you get, this is, this is a whole exercise in uh, material dexterity. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is the trick right here. So I usually, I'm right-handed, so I hold the post in between my pointer finger and my thumb, a couple inches up from the fly. With my left hand, I'm going to start wrapping around, and then I grab it with my right hand off fingers here just to hold it in place. And I wrap it around again with my left, grab it with those fingers, now, if you're unsure of where to stop so you don't crowd the eye, you can stop at any point here and just pull it over and see. So that's kind of right where I want to be. So I'm going to stop there, and then I'm going to wrap right back over the hackle, overlapping wraps again all the way down to the base. Get in there good and tight right at the base, and then I'm going to fold it over. I'm going to put a soft wrap over the top right next to the eye. A couple soft wraps and then a little bit harder wrap, put some pressure on it. And then I'm going to put my left hand, middle finger, and thumb underneath and I'm going to pull it all up out of the way. And I'll do kind of a loose wrap to get it right where I want it and two or three firm wraps. Whip finish half hitch, however you want to finish it. I just do two half hitches, pull it tight, and you're done. Clip this off. Ah, I got some strays. No way. You know why that is? <laughs> it's because I buy cheap your ass scissors. scissors. <laughs> scissors. <laughs> because I abuse them, tying streamers most of the time, and I'm cutting wire, I'm cutting whatever I want because I don't care, <laughs> because they're cheap. If you are going to tie dry flies, have good scissors. <laughs> the Northern Angler has a wonderful selection of scissors. Oh, bravo. This guy. Yeah. Get in Shameless there. Promotion. He just earned his beer for the night, yeah. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I might even get a second one. Um what hook are you tying just, on, Andy? I forget. What hook are you tying on? I forgot to ask you that. It's just a standard. It's a Tamco 100 okay. size 12. Yeah. Just, it was standard whatever I had in my box. I like having that <laughs> down eye for the for the hackle stacker. I mean, I don't know. I like to pull up on my thread, mm -hmm. and that down eye kind of keeps my thread yeah. right in place while I pull everything else out of the way instead yep. of a straight eye, but that's just me. I don't know. Yeah. Nerding on hooks. Nerding on hooks. Nerding out. So that's kind of it. I don't know if you can see it from the bottom. It gives the there's just enough hackle in there to make a very light silhouette of a wing. Cool. Let us uh, let's zoom in on that again. There you go. Yeah, that's a killer silhouette right there. And, and you know, that's a thing that you kind of have to bear in mind whenever you're tying dry flies is think of it from the fish's point of view. What do they see, right? And so that's why you take all that time to split the tail. Yep. Count the tails, things like that, you know, and then proportions are super important at that point. But that turns out great. I think it looks great. Now, I think 
another thing is matching your flies to the water type you're fishing to. A lot of people just grab what's trendy or, you know, the, the, the heaviest hackled fly and then go fish the manistee. <laughs> it's flat, yeah. you know, and it's like, oh, okay, all right. You know, that's why, I, I mean, I use, I don't use as much hackle, I think, as a lot of people. I mean, like, I fish a no-hackle caddis all the time. I mean, that's totally what floating's for. Yeah, yeah. Yep. If I'm fishing the boardman, um, you know, you can go a little bit heavier. If you're out west, you know, fishing one of those rivers, you can get away with heavier stuff. If you're fishing the Manistee, less is more. Less is definitely less more. Is totally definitely agree. More. So that's kind of it for that guy. So, again, we're, we're using the hackle to imitate a wing, not legs. You know, 90% of the time we're using hackle to, to imitate legs. And it's just a different way of using it. Super easy to see on the surface at dusk. Um, and it's fantastic. It's just a super simple pattern, but the stack tackle technique is awesome. And you can play around with it. Um, I brought another, hopefully I brought everything I needed for a different way of using the stack tackle. But I also use stack tackles on like damselflies and all kinds of weird stuff for bass. And, you know, it's, it's super versatile. Yeah, anytime you want a low sitting fly in the water, mm-hmm. that's a great way to do it. Yeah, so they look great. They there fish really, really well. Yes, there we go. Next awesome. one. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do one. it. We'll fill okay. uh, if you want to prep or are you prepped or? I am very close to being prepped. Perfect. Perfect. Well, we can fill some some space. Absolutely. So somehow. I don't know. Let me give a little preface here and say, do not ask what this hook is because it's in a bag and I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I use <Perfect>. this. <laughs> mystery hook. I love fly. a good mystery hook. This so. is, yeah, this came out of a box, like a, the little cardboard, the old, the old must-add Tamco boxes. Um, I'm pretty sure it's a size 8. It's like a long shank hook. I had a thousand of these at one point and i'm down to whatever this is a hundred um, i do tie a lot of hexes on this because it's got the, the the short gape it's a light wire hook um so i can get away with floaty some floaty action with it and it's not overly big i like so this is going to be i'm going to tie a hex spinner on this with the stack tackle but we're going to use the stack tackle to imitate the legs and then we'll put a separate wing in there this fly in particular is a little bit smaller than a lot of the hexes because we're not going to do an extended body, but I catch way more fish right from the first day of hex to the last day of hex on smaller hex patterns. So interesting. If it works for you, it works if for me. It works, you know, it's com- you know, it's confidence, right? Yeah. It looks like a, I'm I mean, ex- if I were, if anyone wanted to equate this to a hook, you know, we get a lot of people that rewatch these, you know, mm-hmm. they want to tie these flies. I'd, probably say a 5262 TMC is yeah. my bet of what's close to that. Yep. It might be, you know, a tinge heavier wire like a one X, but that's okay. Yeah. So kind of same deal here as the last fly we're going to get, go back to about the hook point, wrap the thread on the hook. going to save my little tag end for splitting the, the uh, tailing material. I'm going to use some, Moose mane, I'm just going to, sometimes you get some white ones in there. Just try and pick out like four dark ones. And they're usually all different lengths, so you got to kind of pick and choose to get them lined up right. Do you ever stack these, or do you just stack them by hand? No, I just... <laughs> Your face is so good. Well, I mean, we get questions like that. I just, just, you bit into you a line. If you hang out with me long enough, you'll know that I don't care. <laughs> they catch fish. Um, I'm not super... I would agree. I'll, I'll finger stack them a little bit to get them close, but I'm not too worried about that. I don't think the fish are too worried about that. They do really well. So, again, the same thing. Uh, body length plus a quarter or a half, so one and a quarter to one and a half the body length. Kind of a set them on top of the hook. Uh, I do always do like a light wrap and just barely pull down another light wrap, pull down, and then start wrapping my way up the body. This one we are going to use uh, dubbing on the body, so I kind of want to keep a little bit of a taper to it. I don't want it too flat. Um, 
I see a lot of new tires make a mistake right here. You tie in the tails, they t- put two or three wraps down, and they trim them off. Oh. And, you know, and, and yeah. then, you know, no, oops, you the nick the them, and the, they all come off, and it's you got to wrap those all the way up. Especially you know, if you're using dubbing, you're, you have a naturally tapered material that's going to be thicker on this end and thinner on this end. So if you just lightly wrap your way up the hook, you're going to have a little bit of a taper to begin with. So um, I just kind of... Roughly get that taper going. We can create a little bit of a taper with the with the dubbing without having to go back and forth, back and forth. You can kind of put it on a little thinner towards the back and thicker towards the front. Nice, that looks good. Plus, I think it adds some additional flotation to it. Really, yeah. you can you know with these aren't as stingy as the fibbits. So the micro fibbits, the the moose mane, you could tie it in just like this and leave it. Like you don't have to split them. Um, this stuff kind of naturally uh, spreads itself out. I'm going to roughly get about half on one side, half on the other, and I'll do the same thing with the thread and kind of pull it you know, behind my thread and into the hook bend and just kind of grab it, pinch it together. Spread them out a little bit, bring that thread up, and just loosely set it on top of the body. You don't need to, if you pull it super tight, you're going to spread lay that stuff spread it all all crazy going so just loosely a couple loose wraps to lock it in then you can trim that off so i'm gonna grab same thing super fine on this one honestly i grabbed the first yellow one i found in my box um you can mark, I marker, I use uh, Sharpies on this at the end. You don't have to. I just like the look of it. Um, just grab a little bit of super fine. Uh, since it's a hex, I kind of like, I think this is the color I usually use. It's just a pale yellow. I'm going to use some brown Sharpie on it at the end. Um, <clears throat> if you're new to fly tying or new tying and dries, the super fine you don't have to use wax. You can wrap it on with your fingers. It'll it's stay on pretty so well. so friendly. Yeah. So friendly. friendly. I'd say it's maybe the best dubbing to start with. It's the golden if retriever you're, of dubbing. Yeah. Super it's, fine is super friendly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I kind of... <laughs> like a golden retriever. We don't have fun it's doing that. golden retriever of dubbing. <laughs> I kind of lay it uh, in I want some woof doodle the... <laughs> Sorry. We've derailed now. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I kind of lay it in line with the thread, and I just kind of pull off of the body in my right hand until I get a little bit on there. Sometimes I'll get my finger a little bit wet and just start slowly like twisting at it a little bit just to get it wrapped around. And then I'll leave a little bit more on as I go further up, and that'll that's kind of will give us that taper that I was talking about. And knowing how much to put on the thread, usually for a big body like this, a couple inches, two or three inches is plenty. Um, if you get to the end and you have too much, you can just pull it off. But I start. This is definitely one of those things where we see beginners um, using way too much dubbing. Yep. So if you notice how much dubbing Andy's using right there, that is. It is not much thicker not than much. the thread. But that was a really, really good showcase of how to build a dubbing noodle. Like. I mean, I still find myself, you know, I'll take a little bit from the pack, put it on. Yep. Don't be afraid to take a whole lot out and then just slowly work yeah, it onto that thread. I like that your, a lot. Your pointer and your thumb up against the thread and just pull, kind of pull up as much as you need and just gently wrap it on there. And then we just kind of want to do touching wraps. Work our way up. This is weird. I'm trying to keep my hand off the vise to keep it out of there. I'm used to like doing you're, this all the time. And you're I doing it. a great job. It looks great. <laughs> it doesn't uh, work well with the camera. So that's kind of it. Again, with the spinner, I want about two thirds of the hook shank for the body and the front third for the uh, for the hackle and the wing. Um, trying to remember. I haven't tied this fly in about a year, so I'm trying to remember. I've got this stuff. This uh, clear wing. Clear wing. Mm. Yeah. Hairline clear wing. I love this stuff, especially on this fly. It's the only one I use it on is this fly. Um, 
roughly it comes in a it's like all folded over kind of like those little duct tape things you can get um i'll kind of lay it on top of the hook and just kind of figure out about what size i want <clears throat> i don't know how to describe this but the nice thing about this material is if you cut too much you can just kind of cut it down to size i'm gonna use about that much and then i usually kind of fold it in half Don't worry too much because you can, I usually just kind of eyeball what the the width of the wings I want. So we're going to, that front third that we left open, I want the, the, the wing to kind of be tied in at about the back third of this open space. So I'll kind of move it over on top of the hook shank when I know it's about in the halfway spot. And I'll do a soft wrap over the top. Another soft wrap. And a couple of wraps, harder wraps to hold it in. And then I'm just going to kind of twist it sideways. And that'll kind of, that's roughly the orientation I want. And then I tied it in this way. I'm twisting it. Does that work better? Yes. So I'm kind of twisting it back this way. And then I'm going to wrap the thread to hold that in place on the back side. Nice. The best thing about fishing this fly is the sound it makes as it goes by. <laughs> whistle, whistle, whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so before I put the post in and mess with the hackle and the dubbing, I want to make sure the, the, the wings are kind of where I want them. So these are too big for what I want. Um, I want them actually back about here. Um, so before you put anything, it's easier to just um, push it up from the bottom, and that way line them all up together so when you cut them it's the exact same size on both sides and i'm even going to do i'm going to start up high and kind of work my way back down and that gives it that natural look to the wing a little bit of curve and then like a sharp curve on the back side and hopefully sitting upright you can kind of see it that should be the roughly the shape of the wings that i want and then this stuff is so awesome that you can just kind of push it down and lay it out flat right where you want it. Bam. Bam. That looks great. Yep. This stuff's awesome. Um, so then I'm going to work the thread back to where the, uh, the dubbing stopped. And I'm going to get myself a little uh, post. This is probably a little bit more than I need. And we'll do it the exact same way, same way we did the uh, Hendrickson. Just lay it right on top of the hook. The only difference is we just got to work around the wings a little bit. But these things are so malleable, you can move them wherever you want. A couple loose wraps, a couple tight wraps to lock it in, and then trim off the excess. There we go. Post in place. Peanut gallery. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, we're we're, we're having a debate here. We're so. trying to figure off, out this guy's camera. comment. So okay. we had a we had a question. So sure. he's seen the clear wing. He's never seen in every bin. Clear yet. wing. Yeah, the material. Never seen clear yeah. wing in a shop. We stock uh, that. We do. Yeah, we yeah. stock it. It's in it's in this tiny little package. Like you would like, ask your ask your dutiful ask your a fly help. shop employee who knows ask where every material is. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. There you go. I yeah. even covered really, the gate Like I said, sticker. really <laughs> subtle. <laughs> that's okay. It's okay. Support I your have, local fly shop, whoever yeah. it is. Exactly. That's I our shop at gates. that's our message. I okay. buy stuff there. So if you can see this, um, this is the hackle off of the backside of a old dry fly cape that I have. Um, it's perfect. It's not too webby. It's also not too um, stiff. Um, it'll be perfect for what I want for this. I'm not using this necessarily to, um, to poke down into the water and look like legs. I just want this to pop up above the top of the fly so that I can see it and just give it a little bit of uh, floating ability on top of the water. But it's mainly a visual for me. So I'll tie this sucker in. 
clip off the end so I've got I usually leave a little triangle at the end so that really locks it in and it never gets pulled out soft wrap again this is material handling you can do kind of a soft wrap and then a couple hard wraps to lock it in that's all you need there we go so now that I'm at this point before I actually do the hackle I want to put the dubbing in so that when we pull that post over and the stack tackle we are kind of done with the fly so I'm gonna do the same thing here I'm gonna line it up on the on the thread and just kind of gently push it on there you don't have to twist too much you just got to get it wrapped around so that it gets locked in when you wrap it down I want this to butt right up to the body portion. I don't want a gap there at all. And then a couple wraps behind the wing. A little crisscross. Make sure that I don't have any gaps on the bottom. And then again with this wing material it's awesome because you can mess around with it. Wrap it forward. And it looks like I need a little bit more. There we go. So I'll kind of manipulate those wings back out to where I want them. And I'm gonna do the same thing I did earlier. I'm gonna hold, try and get all the fibers of this holding straight up. And then take the hackle and start wrapping right from the bottom. Stem to stem to stem. You don't want any gaps in here. This hackle is a little webby, so I might have to like brush this out at the end. And until I, I haven't done this in a while, so I don't have it like memorized how many wraps were going up, but you can always check it by just pulling the post over towards the eye of the hook and you can kind of see where it's going to end up. So that's kind of right where I want it. So I'll start wrapping back down again. right down to the base. So if you're not gonna tie this thing off with thread, you want it right in the base so that when I pull it over, it kind of locks it in place. And then the same thing as the last one, I'm gonna keep in that pressure on the post so that everything's in place. I'm gonna lift up from the bottom on everything but that crinkle Z line. And I'm gonna, actually when I say I do that soft wrap, the reason I can do that soft wrap is because when I pull it up, I pinch it in between my middle finger and my thumb, and then I can kind of play around with um, where it's going without losing the tension on all the materials underneath. So kind of do that soft wrap. Oh, I think I missed it. Right behind the eye. I did miss it. Rookie. <laughs> We've all done it. There we go. I got it behind there, and then I'm going to lift the whole thing up and get that Z line out of the way and get a couple wraps in. And I'll do uh, a couple half hitches. I have finished all the thousands and thousands and thousands of dry flies I've ever tied with just those two half hitches, and I've never had one come apart. So You beat me to the question. I mean, I was <laughs> just like, I, I, I hate. <laughs> I said earlier, I took that fly tying class when I was 10 and they taught me how to do the whip finisher. And I came back a week later asking, how do I do the whip finisher again? I forgot. And I just got pissed off at the whip finisher. And I said, I'm never using you again. Sometimes I'll just use my hand um, and I'll wrap it around my fingers a couple times. I'll do that on bigger flies, but it's harder when you're doing small stuff. A couple half hitches, good to go. And then I'll go through and clip that hackle right near the base, pull that Z-line up, clip that down as close as you want, and then kind of spread those wings out. Fluff, little fluff job on the, uh, the hackle. Nice, that looks great. I'd fish that. 
That is the only hex fly I have in my box. Wow. I also don't fish hex fly anymore. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think when you I need do, much more than that. if I'm fishing no. a, a spinnerfall, I've had such good luck on this thing. That's all I use. It's super. It's delicate. It's not the. I think the the deer hair bodied hex that are kind of the standard when you think of a hex. I think the body's too thick, and especially later in the hatch when they start getting picky, you want a really slim profile on the body. You want a really natural looking wing, and you want a little bit smaller size. And usually last three four or five years with kids and stuff i'm usually not able to get out there and he- catch the beginning of the hatch when they're all stupid and i end up getting it's the, the best part <laughs> it's the best part get in get out you know <laughs> yeah. so you could finish it like this if you want i like to um just do a couple little dabs with a sharpie along the edge totally don't have to do this i do this for my own flies just because. Do you ever model the wings at all? Nope. You can do that too if you want. That looks great. Yeah. Cool. We did have a question about that material. If it tears very easily, I, in my experience, it doesn't actually. I have not. It looks it looks really delicate, but yeah. it's I don't know. It's light but pretty durable in my yeah, my experience. I, so. I'm a big fan of it. I like the fact that you can manipulate it on the fly without ruining it. You can pull it back you can pull it up you can pull it forward you know if it gets in a fish's mouth you know and gets all gooky and at the end of the night i've got some some of these that when i first started tying this four or five years ago that i still have that are totally fine so the wings are super durable they're super light too some of the problems with when you start playing around with wing material for hex especially on these bigger bugs um, if the wing material is too rigid it'll start helicoptering on you when it's landing and pretty soon you've got your your tippets all twisted up and so the lighter you can get the less drag that's why you fish like air. what 40 pound or that's, you why know, you just... fish. <laughs> that's why you fish os <laughs> <laughs> it does make it easier yeah <laughs> weird i haven't Again, had that problem <laughs> no, i'm usually I'm... getting out of hex towards the end and they're finicky and i'm using 12 yeah. pound or 10 pound right and, right. Yeah. and it's nice to have a fly that's super easy to cast so Absolutely. I but, like to have, I usually have about 20 of these in my box, and I will put floating on them, you know, before hex starts, and I so I don't have to get them all goopy before you fish, because this, especially the quality of hackle you're going to get that, that that's that big is, is suspect. And if it's soft at all like this is, it'll stay goopy. So if you can put the floating on the night before, um, and if you catch a fish, don't even bother getting the slime off of them or trying to dry it off. Just cut it off, put another one on, and go to town, and then prep the flies the next day before you go back out. What's what? your favorite floating? Dang it, Brian. Being... <laughs> My favorite floating? For that fly. I mean, you said fly? you'd pre-treat oh. it, right? I mean, yeah. gink. Just gink? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I didn't know. Some people no, brush on. Gink. Like, no, absolutely. You know, like... <laughs> I mean, Gink, Aquel, it's all the same, right? Like, are you a, are you a are liquid, you a, I mean, the question, liquid, liquid gel, or um, spray on, or, I mean, there's everything nowadays, uh, so. Liquid. I could not tell you what kind I have. Okay, yeah. I mean, that's where, I, that was my yeah. question. I'll load like, it up with the liquid, let it dry overnight, Yeah. and then if you are in a pinch and you have to reuse one, I always had that powder with me that I'll just hit it and so you can get right back on the water, yeah. but for pre-treating, it's the liquid stuff. I love the liquid. It's amazing. It is. Yeah. It really makes your stuff float like a, a cork. Yeah. Yeah. Dunk it and, you know, let it dry. And let it dry. Yeah. Yep. And then let them fly. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you're just <laughs> throwing down tonight. I promise we've just had one beer. <laughs> Again, I am yes. trapped in Brian Pitzer's basement. <laughs> and he won't let me leave. <laughs> the trap, address is. Don't make bl- me use the trap door. <laughs> don't make me use the trap door. He was door. flickering the lights in <laughs> SOS, I think, earlier. <laughs> Uh, before we wrap up, Andy, yeah. um, do you, I mean, you've been a commercial tire. Um, do you have any tips for people staying consistent, you know, with their tying, with their patterns, anything like that? I mean, yeah. I've seen tons of great tips like, you know, I mean, everyone I know who commercial ties doesn't touch a whip finisher because yeah. it's an extra tool to pick up. It's, you know I mean? It's an extra couple seconds. It's, yeah. Yeah. But if you have any, that. I mean, I think 
you know, you're one of the guys filling the bins that everyone picks up their fly. And like my, I want mine to look like mm-hmm. this. If you have any tips, I know people I, are always interested in that. Usually so. if I would start an order, even when I was really into tying and tying a lot, I would, the first 12 flies that I tied were, I assumed were going to be garbage. Like you have to tie. If you really want to get tying flies that are exactly the same plan on the first dozen or two are going to be a little sketchy. It's usually the third dozen that it really, really dials in. So it's, it's getting to do the same thing every time. It's not just using the same material, um, the same technique it's holding the fly the same way and once you get past that first dozen or two then it starts to kick in where i stop right here i put the wing in here this is how long the wing is that's when they those flies in the bin that look really good those were not the first two dozen i guarantee you (laughs) right how much material prep do you do you know if you're if you're sitting down and you're I i mean of course if you're commercial tying you're sitting down to tie more than six you know or eight i mean I'm just curious if you do much. When I was doing it, it was different for me because I had a full-time job and I would have an hour here or an hour there. So it was easier. I I couldn't sit down and tie 12 dozen in a day. It was, you know, a dozen or two at lunch, a dozen or two before bed. You know, I was trying to fit it in whenever I could and I would prep by two dozen at a time. You know, kind of like I did tonight, I showed up with a little Ziploc bag and I would do the same thing when I was tying commercial orders. I would unpack all the material. I would throw, I would go through and figure out which biots were the right length out of the packs. I would put all those biots into a bag and on the bag I would write number 12 penny spinner. I would count out the hooks. If it was, you know, 300 fly order, I'd put in... 300 fly or 300 hooks plus two dozen <laughs> scrap, you know, right. that I assumed were going to be scrap. And those would go in my own box. The first two dozen, um, you know, the just little things like the fibbits, taking them out of the plastic container and putting the fibbits right in the bag. Um, having the thread in, there's the no way to prep fibbits. I've tried. But no, <laughs> forget them. not unless you want to go insane. It's the most tedious part of that fly guaranteed yep. is just picking four out. Yeah. <laughs> it's madness, um, but, yeah, I'd do all that. You know, if you're tying um, nymphs or something like that, I'd count out all the beads. I'd have I had little plastic containers that I would keep all the beads in. They'd be counted out. The hooks would be in little plastic containers. So when I did get an hour to tie, I just I could set it all right down. I knew it was all ready to go. So a lot of times, if I was tying dries like this, I would spend an hour or two just going through hackle and getting what I thought was enough hackle for the whole order. So so I wouldn't have to go through and check. Sure. I mean, there's, I think I, I really like that Ziploc idea. I know, um, Ted did that forever. I mean, I've seen him just drop off a bag full of everything you need for exactly this fly. And I was talking about that. I think it with Joe the other day at work and he's like, yeah, that's, that makes sense. Just everything for this one fly in one bag. Because I don't know about you guys. I have a lot of stuff (laughs) and digging, just digging for, the right dubbing, I mean, can take 10 minutes. Yeah. I mean, and then, you know, you had half an hour to tie, poof, there's 10 minutes. So I had so much of this, you know, this particular dubbing, I probably got 10 of these containers at home. And so putting two of them in a bag and putting, you know, number 16 sulfur compared on, on that and throwing a couple in there, good to go. Like I never had to look for them again. And a lot of these flies I would tie every year. And so it just made it easier the next year to not have to dig through all my stuff looking for it. Unlike I, I did last night. <laughs> and well, thanks for digging I, through. Your we stuff. appreciate we that. Appreciate because it. I haven't commercially tied in a long time, so I had to go through all my crap and hopefully had the right stuff. Well, you did. It turned out really, really yeah. well. I, th- I have one tip for people that it's the tip I never listened to for myself, and it's put your stuff away in the right spot when you're done tying. It, almost count that as part of your tying time. You know, if it's five minutes, you know, well, you know, start it, finish at nine fifty five because then you're not spending so much time looking for it. And That's a good this point. is a tip I never listened to myself. You can I go wish, look at my desk. It's madness. But I wish we were doing this in my basement and I could show you how I, I'm also a little OCD. So my stuff is like it's meticulously laid out. Everything's labeled. It's 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 that whole reason being able to find something quickly. Yeah. So just like are, a good are you a label box. maker guy? 
<laughs> oh, yeah. You have no idea. I've got like three different label makers. Oh, and nice. I got one at work where I can do big four inch labels, oh. which doesn't apply to fly tying at all. But that is so cool. I, bet we, I bet we could find a way for it to, to apply. Yeah, I, so. I want to check that out. I've got a I've got a big tote with raft supplies for my raft. I've got fly fishing, you know, just everything's right there. I just I don't want to spend time looking for stuff. Right. Makes sense. Yeah. I love it. I love it. All right, we're going to wrap up uh well, actually let's ask Brian this last question because he's our resident uh floating um So we expert. did have a question about the liquid pretreating it leaving a residue. Mm-hmm. So depends which one you're depends using. Depends on I think. which one you're using. For sure the 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 loon fly dip will turn everything light. It's very messy to work with, but it does, uh, it makes your flies float really well. Yep. Flagger is probably my one of choice. And then there's, there's, a, uh, the, the frogs or Flagra. no, um, what's, oh, shoot, Flagra. we had it. Yeah. I know. Great name, right? Yeah, I mean, it name. might be the best. And the Tiemco, the Tiemco. Tiemco Shimazaki is, the is good. Shimazaki liquid. What is the other one? And if you use the Shimazaki oh, it pre-treat, it's know. even really better. So high and dry, high and dry. That that one's good. That doesn't leave. Get. Yeah, it doesn't. That's leave. a good one though. It is a good this, one. We were big fans. This is the point so. in the show where we have lost all. <laughs> Shockingly, of the we that have are not all the viewers still. People, so. Right. <laughs> we'll do anyway, a whole episode on this. What the shit are uh, these guys talking <laughs> about? These guys are like we're like Trekkies and we're speaking uh, whatever Star Klingon. Trek language. Yeah, we're Klingons and we're speaking you know Trekkie language. We are we are such geeks. And there is no doubt about that. We're all going to sign off like this tonight <laughs> for sure. <laughs> you know what? Proud to be it. Yeah. yeah. Nerds. Nerds align. We right? are such nerds. <laughs> oh, man. Well, big, big, big thanks to Andy for, for tying some flies for us tonight. Some I hope you all try the hackle stacker technique. I think it's something that's a little different. And Russ said it best when uh, angler, he said angler advantage. You know, a little bit different flies can can really make a difference. You know, when everyone else is fishing out of a, the bins, you know, if yeah. you can tie something slightly different, it can pay off. It makes so a difference. Big, less, big thanks to Andy. Less thanks is more with spinners. Everyone for for tuning in tonight. Uh, excited for next week as well. We got Kevin Feenstra on the Redemption Tour. Yay. <laughs> let's hope it all works out. I won't be here, but let's um, hope it all if works anybody. Out. Remembers last year, that's when our internet just went out at the shop, like, what, three minutes in? It was oh, bad. it just blew up. It was, that's the problem with doing live. Yes, it is, but is it I, we is keep it hearing, we keep having uh, guys, you know, liking this stuff. So um, one big thing that Brian and I worked on is the Fly Fishing Film Tour is coming back to Traverse City March 5th. Woo-hoo. Um, so we are very excited for that. Real excited. Come hang out and uh, get your tickets. Where's it going to be? City, City Opera, Opera House. House. Tickets are only available through the City Opera House box office, which that's kind of the kind of the thing nowadays. So just and make sure you get those. We were able to get a Saturday night. We had a lot of comments in the past. We could only get a Friday night, so we were able to get a Saturday night. So people want to travel, come up, spend the weekend in Traverse, come see the fly fishing film tour. It should be great. And if nobody's been to that venue, it is fantastic. It's a beautiful venue. It's it's, it's cool. It feels that. way too classy for us. I'm pretty sure I'm so. going to see Frozen this Saturday. Oh, something oh, there with wow. my daughter. Are you so going to dress up? Awesome. I, don't know. I will dress up. Yes, as a reindeer. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> nice. No. <Okay>. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> totally yeah. thought you were serious. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, you know, you would be like the number one dad in all of. Oh Michigan yeah, you'd be. You that, think right? of all the kids who just. Oh my gosh! <laughs> all right, we're, we better cut ourselves off. <laughs> Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Uh, and then I'm going to remember to hit the end animation this time. So right. there's information about other stuff you should check out. So. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to fade up the music and narrate it. How about that? Nice.
Yo.